going. All right, so welcome to the third session on the history of medicine. I'll get the PowerPoint open here and we will be ready to roll. Uh, I've got the chat open, but uh, feel free to chime in and let me know if you have any questions or if anything strikes your fancy, feel free to enter an LOL or some other comment in the chat. It really does pep things up from my end. And tonight we're going to talk about the history of diagnosis and treatment. So we've talked about ancient medicine and how it developed up until roughly the Enlightenment period. Then we talked about how theories of disease and wellness changed over time. And now we're going to look at what people actually did to try to help people get healthy. So back in ancient Egypt, the theory of disease was based around the fluxing of purulent bad food from the gut out to the body, causing swellings, pus, cancers, things like that. And the treatment was largely directed towards trying to remove the nasty material through bleeding, enemas, purgatives, things like that. And the papyri that we have that detail Egyptian medical practice, like the Edward Smith and Everest papyrus, do actually list a fairly significant number of uh, drugs, or at least pharmaceutical interventions that the Egyptians would use to try to get people's body back in harmony. And crushed uh, gems would be my favorite, uh, one of those things that people would use. I think that's a very early version of maybe Goldschlager, where people would have the, uh, the gold mixed in with their uh, cheap vodka. But other things like beer, turpentine, uh, berries, and uh, other natural substances would be used. And one fun thing I've seen, uh, this has never been authenticated, but it's been theorized that the eye of Horus here might actually be the origin of our symbol for pharmacology. So I don't know if that's actually true, but I think it's uh, be nice and poetic if it had a little hint of it there. We've talked about the uh, Roman physician Galen and his contributions to research into how the body worked. Interestingly, Galen, despite writing a huge amount of material, really did not have much to say when it came to treatment. He really didn't do much innovation in treatment. He popularized the idea that uh, bleeding people to restore their humoral balance was something that you would rely on kind of as a go-to. So he was relatively conventional when it came to intervening for disease, even though his theories on how the body worked were groundbreaking and ultimately wrong, but still very persuasive for their time. So we've talked about bleeding a few times, and bleeding has been a treatment that's been around for most of human history. We're all actually very lucky that we live in an age where bleeding is no longer considered to be the go-to treatment. In fact, uh, George Washington is thought to have uh, been moved quicker to his death because of the very uh, enthusiastic bleeding that was done when he was trying to recover from an illness. So. Bleeding has been around for a long time and doing lancet cuts of, you know, opening the veins with a double-edged scalpel or some other sharp object has been pretty prominent. Using leeches to draw blood is actually very common and in fact is still used occasionally as leeches are able to do a really good job of pulling blood out of a very small area and are actually fairly capable of removing hematomas if need be. Uh, the ones that really just disturb me to no end are these devices, these spring-loaded, what are called scarificators. You can see one here, second from the right, near the bottom of the screen. And they're basically spring-loaded blades that would be pushed up against the person's arm and then triggered, and it would cause multiple cuts that would cause bleeding. And after a person had lost a pint or two or more and started to feel faint, it was felt that the person had then been bled enough, and they would try to put a little bit of a tourniquet around it to staunch the blood at that time. So in addition to the bleeding as a method of treatment, there were various concoctions and various pharmacologic treatments. And I'm using pharmacologic in a very loose manner, nothing concerned with the normal modern version of pharmacology. But what was used historically was referred to as materia medica or medical materials. And the person who really brought that definition into prominence was another contemporary of Galen's, a guy named uh, Pediasius Dioscorides. And he was also Greek, like Galen, and he was alive during the Roman era, and he served in the army like many uh, physicians of note. He did a botanical work called De Materia Medica, which is where the term came from, not only describing the medicinal properties of various plants, both effective and ineffective, but also drew 
guides to what they looked like because the world in the Roman Empire was expanding and they were encountering plants and botanicals and other things that they'd never seen before. He was doing his best to make sure people could actually identify the leaves, the berries and the other um, plant based treatments that he would describe. Now, this work actually remained in common usage up until the 1600s in the 17th century, and it's still available for print. I actually did a little uh, looking a while back, and you can still find copies of this. So, again, if uh, you have goals as an author at some point, being able to uh, stay in print for nearly 2,000 years, that's pretty prime. Now, we mentioned that after the fall of the Roman Empire, the majority of the scientific Western activities shifted into the Islamic empires in the Middle East, all the way around the Mediterranean into Spain as the Islamic empires expanded. So Baghdad, Damascus, and uh, later Constantinople were, uh, pardon me, Constantinople first, and then Baghdad and Damascus became high culture places where that um, learning was maintained. So Avicenna, who was mentioned in the last or the part of the first lecture, uh, wrote the canon of medicine and basically not only categorized disease, as we mentioned before, but also listed many different uh, ways that you could treat people. And he grouped them into what were called simples and compounds. And it really is not that difficult. Simples are just things that are given to people as they are, whereas compounds were things that were combined, refined, chopped up, mixed together and so forth. So he collected those pharmacologic treatments and did a great deal of commentary on how they would work together to either offset one another or advance the activity of one another. Al-Razi was another scholar at the time, and he was one of the alchemists who was responsible for adding or uh, basically elaborating the theory that all matter is made of a mixture of mercury and sulfur. This is called the mercury sulfur theory. And it underlies a lot of the ideas that the alchemists had about changing substances from one to the other. It wasn't felt that, you know, material uh, matter was inherently different from each other. It was just the level of mercury or sulfur in each material that made it different. And if you could refine it, add more mercury, add more sulfur, you could actually change or transmute one element to another. So that was where the alchemical ideas of changing things like lead into gold really came from. And what really came in a lasting scientific way from this work were the techniques that were developed in the process of understanding this. So distilling, extracting, concentrating different botanical substances is something that we have as a result of that alchemical research. Now the treatments were still directed towards a very Hippocratic ideal, which was balancing the humors, making sure that someone's blood, black bile, yellow bile, and phlegm were in a perfect balance for that person. <clears throat> but it was not felt that everyone had the same balance. Everyone was thought to have a distinctive humoral kind of baseline that was kind of programmed into them as they developed in the womb because of the influence of the planets, the sun, the moon, which is why astrology was such a big deal at the time. Now, don't confuse medieval and Renaissance astrology with the horoscopes that we see in the newspaper. This is a very sophisticated uh, undertaking that people had at the time to try to figure out what the positions of the various celestial objects were so that they could figure out what the humoral balance of a person might be and what their personality was. Now, the fact that it turned out not to be valid doesn't actually make the pursuit of it any less sophisticated than it was. It was because of astrology that astronomy was able to eventually become a science of its own and come up with ways to describe how the planets, the stars move. But the reason it was done was because it was felt that the planets, the moon, and the sun had an influence on the development of a person and that when you were born, you had various um, propensities as a result of that and that your doctor had to take those into account when treating you. So that's what was going on in the Middle East at the time. Europe, after the fall of the Roman Empire, really took a turn for the worse. And medical treatment followed suit. Illness was basically blamed on supernatural causes. So we're going back to the pre-Hippocratic situation where uh, sin, familial guilt, 
demons, supernatural judgment were all thought to be the cause of illness. Now, physicians at the time still held themselves above people who practiced manual labor. And in fact, we have a nice little example of that here. The physician is this person here dressed in the red robe. Now, if anyone here is a history major or can tell me what's going on, I would love to know. I've never found a good example for why this scarf that looks like a pair of breasts is all over the place. But we see it in a lot of different illustrations, and I really don't understand what the significance of it is. But the point I'm trying to make in this slide is that here's the physician staring at a jar while all these sick people are nearby. This jar was one of the few diagnostic tools that the physicians used, and it was basically a jar full of urine. And they would look at the urine that was gathered by some lowly manual laborer here. This person was probably a butcher or a surgeon or a barber passing a catheter into someone so that he can actually make urine for the physician to examine. And physicians used urine wheels to examine the color and diagnose the problem that the person had. And that was really one of the major diagnostic tools that physicians had before going to tell people that they were going to bleed them for X number of pints of blood and call it a day. Now, this obviously seems a little bit odd. However, it's not completely alien to what we know is going on these days. For example, you can see the urine here normal compared to someone with a urinary tract infection. So we have some um, pus, some white uh, blood cells, some bacteria in there. Myoglobinuria, we've got breakdown of muscle proteins that's been filtered out, gotten through into the urinary drainage apparatus and blood in the urine, hematuria. So examining the urine is not in and of itself a bad way to go about things, but as it was mentioned in the chat, was it accurate in any way? Probably not according to what we want. It probably wasn't looking at hydration levels or looking at infectious states because those concepts weren't really around. It was probably more used as a way to judge how to deal with the humoral imbalance that was thought to be occurring in that person. Now, I'm sure a few of you have been wondering when I'm going to get around to pandemic disease, and I've not been avoiding it, although it's obviously something that we would, wouldn't mind doing without at this current day and time. But the, the high watermark for pandemic disease remains the Black Death, the bubonic plague. So at the time, it was known more as the Great Mortality, and the major influx of it into Europe first occurred in the 14th century, and it just washed through the Middle East, Europe, and it kind of made a little bit of what I'd call a uh, clockwise circuit from the Middle East through Southern Europe up to Northern Europe into Iceland, and then finally back around into Russia. So it kind of made a circular track around the Eurasian region. Essentially, it came from the steppes of Asia, and the Mongols brought it with them as they were ransacking various places, and they were sieging a city called Kaffa, which is on the Black Sea. And Kaffa was a major trading port, and Italian traders from Genoa had a very you know large base there. And they were able to keep themselves supplied because the Mongols didn't have a navy. But the Mongols, getting sick and tired of besieging the city and having plague breaking out in their camp, broke camp and run away. But before they did, they took part in the first known instance of biological warfare by catapulting plague victims into the city. And those plague victims, and probably the fleas on them, did in fact uh, pass the Black Death to the people in Kaffa. The genies traders left, and then every port they went to spread the plague, and it basically jumped from port to port in Europe, and then worked its way overland in a much more slow manner eventually causing a third to a fourth of the people in Europe to die at the time. So at the time, they didn't know anything about the bacillus that was infesting the fleas that were infesting the rats and jumping from ship to ship and actually biting the people. So what did they blame it on? Well, the uh, medieval Europeans blamed it on divine judgment. Uh, Jewish communities were scapegoated in a sadly typical fashion. Whenever something went wrong in Europe, it was... Uh, often blamed on Jewish communities. And Jewish communities tended to be a little more isolated and have greater hygiene levels due to some of the, um, I don't say habits, but more of the uh, practices common in the Jewish religion that kept them a little more hygienic 
and they were seen to be a little more unaffected by some of the plague passing as they were more isolated and more common for people to blame them and suggest that they were poisoning the wells of nearby cities and causing the Black Death to occur. Obviously garbage, but at the time it gave people someone to blame for that contagion that was just passing not only from person to person, but from city to city. But the main idea comes back to miasmas or bad air. And the idea was that just as the planets, the moon and the sun affect the human body as we develop, inside the earth, somewhat indistinguished matter is affected by the rays coming from the different planets in the sun and the moon and will form different elements. So exposure to a lot of sunlight creates gold, moonlight creates silver, and it was thought that an especially inauspicious con combination of planetary and solar com um, exposure would cause bad, deadly air that would be released from the ground and then create the death create the black death that spread throughout Europe. So the bad air, pardon me, the bad air or miasma was held to be locked in the earth until it was opened. And if you think about people who were mining and would occasionally hit large chambers full of carbon dioxide that would kill them instantly, it's not a terrible explanation. It doesn't turn out to be accurate by our contemporary standards, but at the time it did correlate with some of the observances people had about how air trapped underground would actually affect people. So how do you fight bad air? Well, the obvious answer was to fight it with good air, perfumed air. And if we see our picture of the plague doctor here, the plague doctor's mask and the beak within it contained spices and flowers, uh, flower petals, different scented oils as a way to combat the bad air by mixing in good air with it and neutralizing it. Now, these plague doctor suits didn't come along until roughly the 16th century, so they're not actually present during the early 13 and 1400s, but they were made not only from that mask, but oiled leather gauntlets and a cloak, boots, a hat, and even though the intent was to keep bad air away from the physician, it practically became a medieval hazmat suit and did a fairly, I want to say not great, but a fairly decent job of keeping infected fleas from biting the physicians. So it actually did work, but not for the reasons that we expected. So we have pandemic disease ravaging Europe and the Middle East. And then the Mongols continued their onslaught, destroying Baghdad, destroying other cities in the area. They didn't get to Constantinople, or at least didn't take it down. That had to wait for uh, the Ottoman Empire and the, Vien uh, pardon me, the Venetians a little bit earlier. But the scholars who were displaced from Damascus and Baghdad and then later Constantinople fled into Europe and the European universities were already present and already serving as a very good landing place for these displaced scholars. So throughout the Middle Ages, the scholars would go there. They would bring more accurate translations of the early Roman and Greek authors. And at that point, um, Islamic physicians were considered to be the high status authority. And in fact, several medieval and early, early Renaissance authors would, uh, in Europe, would disguise themselves by giving themselves fake Arabic names to make their work seem a little more high status for their readers in Europe. So within the university, we started to get a very rigid hierarchy of authority and authority, especially based on the textual correctness when we looked at Aristotle when we looked at Galen, when we looked at Avicenna, was put at a much higher level than actual experimentation or observation. And the uh, people who were at the highest level were the physicians of the long robe, doctors who wore a very long coat, if you will, and they were the ones that everyone looked up to. And those walking around with short coats, anybody who's been in the clinic can start snickering to yourself, were considered to be of lower status and often aimed to get their own long coat someday. Now, another source of treatment in the medieval and Renaissance era is fantastic. It was magic. It was literally magic. Now, magic at the time, despite my Harry Potter reference here, was not casting with wands and making incantations. Rather, magic served as a really interesting precursor to the actual scientific study of nature. Because magic held that at the time of creation, God had put different sympathies 
between substances in the world, and that by reading those sympathies correctly, known as the doctrine of signatures, people could figure out how connections existed between material substances, between different objects, and between them and divine activity. And so basically it was a way for people to try to find harmonies in nature and use them to tell the future, solve problems, and heal the ill. So real quick, go ahead and get your chat ready because I do want a little bit of interactivity with this part. We are gonna do some magical clinical case studies. So put on your 13th century cap and let's solve the problem for this patient. A knight is feverish and phlegmatic, producing a lot of phlegm. He's got a lot of nasal discharge. His imbalance is brought about by excess phlegm weakening his brain. So what sort of a dietary intervention might we suggest to him by the doctrine of signatures to strengthen his brain? Let's go ahead and chat in. Oh, there we go. Willow bark, interesting choice. Now, if you said willow bark because it might have uh, aspirin in it, that's uh, jumping ahead. We're not uh, we're not quite there yet. Cinnamon. Why cinnamon and spices? <clears throat> Any other takers? It was a popular spice at them. All right. Bloodletting. Yeah, bloodletting is always the answer, but. Uh, what does the doctrine of signatures suggest we might have someone eat to strengthen their brain? Eh, what about a walnut? Obviously, a walnut must be linked to the brain somehow because it kind of sort of looks like a brain. And that's how you'd apply the doctrine of signatures. Let's do one more. So we have a Venetian merchant who has, sorry, it's not comic style. I didn't tell you the age or the location of treatment. But a Venetian merchant has a naturally cold disposition due to the way he was uh, formed in the womb. He needs to eat more warming foods. However, the Ottoman Empire has blockaded Constantinople and we have very few spices and other innately hot foods available. What other sort of thing might be advantageous to offset his naturally cold disposition? And don't type bloodletting because that one's been covered already. Mead, okay, we're jumping a little, it's a little more Northern European. We had wine, mead was a little bit more of a Northern European thing. A pepper, yeah, pepper is not bad, except that's coming from the New World, so we don't have that yet. Tea, not quite over from China yet. Soup, soup's not bad, warm soup, porridge. But might I suggest we look into the humble sunflower? Because what does the sunflower look like? It's in the name, it kind of looks like the sun. So sunflower seeds obviously have some sort of connection to the sun and might bring some of that warmth into this person's cold disposition and offset their illness. So this is exactly the sort of thing that people would do to apply the doctrine of signatures in Renaissance era magic to cure people. Oh, now normally I would have you guys just shout this out. So anybody want to know about sword balm? It's a real fun little case of how the doctor and signatures can be taken to a fairly ludicrous extreme. So let's say somebody got stabbed by a sword. Oh, man. So he's on the ground bleeding. His uh, assailant has run away and dropped the sword that stabbed him. What physicians would do is they would pick up the sword, and it was thought that there were still tiny little molecules connecting the sword to the wound that it had caused. And to soothe the wound, we would take some balm or some sort of an ointment. We wouldn't put it on the wound. No, no, no. We'd rub it into the sword. You would rub the, the balm into the sword to soothe the wound that it had made, somehow thinking that by quieting the anger of the sword, you were quieting the anger of the wound. So I just want to drive home. Even though the doctrine of signatures and Renaissance level era magic is fun, it is based on fundamentally flawed assumptions from our contemporary understanding of how the world actually works. All right, so let's jump ahead to the father of toxicology and one of the people who actually started moving alchemy towards chemistry. This is Paracelsus, and his full name, which I have to look at the screen to properly give you, is Philippus Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, and he lived up to every syllable of that name. He studied extensively astrology, alchemy, medicine, metallurgy. He did a lot of work in mines and learning how different metallurgic processes worked and how you would refine 
different metals. And he took the alchemical theory of the sulfur-mercury dichotomy and added salt to it. So made it kind of a trio of things that combined with each other to make matter in the world. He did, looked at how different plants would affect disease, but he was really keen on using Germanic plants. He was Swiss, and he liked, liked the idea of Northern European plants to treat Northern European people, feeling that there was some sort of a sympathy in the area and the plants that grew within it and the people that lived in it. Now, he's the first person to give us the idea that poison is not poison innately, but it's the dose. So if you've ever heard that it's the dose that makes the poison, this is something that came to us from Paracelsus. Now, he was a real iconoclast. He publicly burned, uh, to open up his lectures, he'd burn copies of Galen and Avicenna to kind of show people that he was striking out on his own assumptions and trying to start with as few references to the past masters as possible. And he was just as obnoxious a person as you would expect in his contemporary uh, everyday life as he was as a lecturer. And he basically got kind of drummed from town to town, alienating people and getting into various legal problems and then lecturing a few towns over to keep a few steps ahead of his legal problems. And it is rumored that all the work we have of his is not actually from him directly, but were uh, notes taken by his students as he was getting drunk in a tavern and just kind of laying forth his theories on this, that, or the other. So we've got botanical interventions operating pretty much continuously from the Roman era up until the time we're talking about. And so in Padua, where we had Vesalius, actually very contemporaneously, Vesalius working on anatomy, the first botanical garden completely devoted to growing botanical preparations for medical treatment was uh, developed. And this garden is actually still in existence. I've not been there, but if I make it to Padua, it's one of the places I intend to stop to see this botanical garden and how it was used as a way to grow simples, aka single substances that could be used for medical treatment. Now, where did this lead us? We had different botanical preparations that could have effects, but Different berries and leaves contain varying levels of the substance that may be effective. And depending on when you harvest it, there might be a lethal dose of something or there might be a non-existent dose of something. And so we really kind of got a step towards standardizing it and actually extracting the functional structures within these substances in 1785 with William Withering. Now, he was looking at fox purpura. And he basically was understanding that uh, wise women and people who had foxglove knew that it worked to help those suffering from dropsy. Now, dropsy would basically be what we would call heart failure these days. You had massive swelling all over the body due to heart failure, due to being unable to pump blood effectively, and it backing up and sweating out into the extracellular space. And this foxglove would actually do a very good job of keeping that swelling down and increasing excretion from the kidneys, but it would also kill people every so often. So after he had started consulting on this, he learned how to dose it, how to refine it in such a way that foxglove now is not what we refer to it as. We refer to it as the drugs derived from it, digitalis and dioxin. And this allowed people a little bit of a roadmap for taking botanical substances and isolating effective treatments from them. Now, as the Enlightenment proceeded, we had a really amazing development, and the development was a whole laundry list of what were called imponderable fluids, fluids that permeated all around us that we just were unaware of, we couldn't see, but had effects on us. Now, my personal favorite of the imponderable fluids that turned out to be nothing was phlogiston. Now, phlogiston was this theoretical fluid that allowed things to burn. So if I have a log, it's just absolutely saturated with phlogiston because that log can burn like crazy. But once I've burned it, I've removed all the phlogiston, I'm left with ash, and it would be what we'd call deflogenated wood. So it was felt to be this fluid that allowed things to burn, and it was actually theorized to have negative mass at some point to explain why burning some substances actually made them heavier than when they were before they were burned. Now, Galvani understood that you could actually make muscles contract by 
having them contact electrical charges. They had a thing called a Leiden jar present at the time that basically built up a fairly significant amount of static electricity and held it as a capacitor until it was discharged. And he knew that you could make frog legs contract using that electrical motion. That was further elaborated by Volta in Italy, who then also in Italy, pardon me, who found that you could get the same effect through chemical interactions between zinc and copper, linking electricity to chemistry. Now, another one that was theorized to exist at the time was what was called electrical fire. An electrical fire was thought to be what lightning bolts are made of. And electrical fire is most famously associated with founding father Benjamin Franklin. And electrical fire is a, essentially the foundation of our modern society. All of our electronics derive from the fact that we can store and create electrical energy. So here's a nice artistic rendering of Ben Franklin linking the idea that electricity, aka the static electricity from the Leyden jar, was the same as the lightning in the heavens. Now, I was obviously not there. I don't know how many cherubs were present at the time. Apparently, his uh, illegitimate son was there helping him out, but I don't think there were cherubs there. This is a pretty nice rendition of how uh, Franklin discovered electricity. I prefer this one. Franklin uh, stealing electricity directly from Zeus with his Wolverine claws there, but uh, I think, sadly, probably not the way it panned out. I should also mention that Ben Franklin created the uh, lightning rod, and whereas uh, houses used to burn down regularly when they would be hit by lightning, the introduction of the lightning rod would channel that discharge from the highest point of the house down into the ground and basically stopped houses from burning down due to electrical strikes, which had been a major problem up until then. Now, last and not least was animal magnetism. Now, you may have heard people refer to animal magnetism as someone being very charismatic. But in fact, it was a theory developed by a guy named Franz Anton Mesmer. And if you've ever heard of someone being mesmerizing, that's where we get that from. He was someone who used what we now consider to be post-hypnotic suggestion to get his patients to come up with various ways to cure their ailments. So Franz Anton Mesmer believed that there was this animal magnetism that permeated the universe and it flowed through human beings and then if it got blocked somewhere in our body it would cause nervous diseases or anxiety or some sort of neurosis and so he would treat people by waving his hands in front of them trying to adjust the flow of animal magnetism and essentially it, it worked it did work and he was able to cure people but what we would consider it to be now is that he basically had a way of doing post-hypnotic suggestion to people, getting them into a state where they would actually be receptive to suggestion, deal with their um, anxieties and other imbalances in that way. He, however, insisted that it had to be due to animal magnetism and nothing else. And amongst the people who were uh, eventually debunked him, by doing experiments where his patients were blindfolded and couldn't see where they were being adjusted or where the person's hands were waving was uh, one of the Americans on um, diplomatic uh, mission in France at the time, that'd be Ben Franklin. So Ben Franklin not only discovered electricity for us, he also helped debunk mesmerism. This is a children's book and uh, my kids have it and you better believe I was jumping up and down with joy when I saw it in the bookstore. I was like, oh, we are so getting that book. So, Franz Anton Mesmer did actually discover something worthwhile that became more useful when it was uh, adopted by Freud and other psychoanalysts, but by insisting on his theory being true over the practical effects, he basically lost credibility and lost a great deal of his um, potential push and an influence over medical history. Now, the idea of impeding flow through the body would later impact AT still, but he was looking at things like lymphatics and arteries and veins, actual physical things that could be verified to exist. All right, so now let's talk about how assessment of health was done. Instead of looking at urine and simply taking the pulse and feeling for fever, we started to get in the Enlightenment era some actual diagnostic tools that were far more useful. So we had the idea that organs were somehow diseased because of the pathology that was developing at the time. So we had uh, Giovanni Battista Morgani writing his Seats and Causes of Disease, 
and physicians looking for disease or dysfunction of different organs. So in France, auscultation and percussion were developed to assess the lungs and the body cavities. So tapping on someone to see if you could come up with a way to check whether there was fluid in a body cavity, listening with your ear to their chest to see if the lungs had kind of a gritty grinding noise associated with them or a kind of a bubbling noise. And so the French really pioneered the physical exam. And the person who came up with the most uh, intensive work on auscultation and percussion was named Jean-Nicolas Corvassar. And he was actually born the son of an innkeeper and came up with the idea for percussion by remembering that his dad would check to see if wine casks were full by tapping on them. And that's how he came up with the idea of percussing to be able to check whether there was fluid in a cavity or not. Now, he had a student named René Theophile Hyacinth Lenec. It's a very flowery name, and it was a very shy, retiring person who was associated with this name. And he invented the stethoscope out of pure social awkwardness. He was so flustered at the idea that he had to put his ear to the chest of a patient who was in heart failure that um, the patient was an, an obese woman it was very uh, hot in, in Paris at the time, and it was she was very sweaty, and he just was not interested in sticking his head right next to her chest. He was very retiring, very shy person anyway, and he literally fled the room when he was told he had to do that. But he was outside and came to his senses and realized that when he was a kid, they'd play a game where they'd put a stick up to their ear, somebody would scratch on it, and they'd be able to hear. So he rolled up a piece of paper, stuck that to her chest, put the other end in his ear, and realized that it actually was more useful than sticking his ear directly onto her chest. And he was able to take that observation and create the first, um, the first actual stethoscopes. Now, the first stethoscopes were these kind of linear um, bells. He actually ground them or kind of used a lathe to make them himself. And if you bought a copy of his book where he described stethoscopic examination, he would send you for a few extra um, bits of money uh, an actual hand-lathed, stethoscope. So this became the universal symbol for I am a doctor. And it was how people were actually able to assess the function of the heart and the lungs. Now he actually passed away from tuberculosis uh, that he caught on the wards, which was a disease he'd done a great deal to characterize and understand, especially by using his stethoscope to chart the progression and the effects that it had on the lungs as it went further through its various stages. Now we're jumping around a little bit, but modern microbiology, the idea that there were microbes that caused disease, didn't come along until we had the microscope. But one of the first precursors to it came from a guy named Edward Jenner. Now he was a student of a very famous surgeon, uh, William Harvey, who we'll talk about next time. But he was uh, in practice in the, country, uh, the countryside of England, and he heard a rumor that turned out to be true. And it was that milkmaids rarely got smallpox. Now smallpox is a horrendously vicious disease, had up to 40% mortality. It's been one of those diseases that has affected humanity throughout our entire life. And again, we're very lucky because the smallpox uh, in the wild has been eradicated. It's the first disease wiped out by medical science. And it was done so because we started understanding how microbes work and how inoculation and vaccination can actually make it better. And that started because Edward Jenner was told that milkmaids never got smallpox because if they got cowpox, which was a related but very mild disease, it made them immune to later smallpox. Now, at the time, people had been inoculating others for smallpox for quite a while. If someone was suffering from smallpox, you would actually take a small crust from one of their pustules, put it on a needle, and you'd poke someone with it. And it was thought that, well, it was actually, yeah, it worked, that it would actually cause a very mild smallpox um, infection, and people would fight it off and be immune. So that's how inoculation got started. But in the chat, what's the problem with taking a bit of smallpox pus and, and injecting it into somebody? Ooh, it's gotten very silent or else we've got very extensive comments coming. There we go. It is live. You just gave them smallpox. Exactly. So it would often cause a very mild reaction and people would be immune, but sometimes they would get a full-blown lethal case of smallpox. 
Jenner, coming up with the idea that cowpox would confer the same advantages, started vaccinating people. And the word vaca means cow. So vaccination literally means inoculation from a cow. And so cowpox was used as the way to vaccinate people and make them immune from smallpox. And it worked fantastically well and was thought to be a much greater advantage than the smallpox inoculations. Another uh, American jump back. Uh, one reason that the Revolutionary Army was able to actually outlast the British was that George Washington mandated that all soldiers be inoculated against smallpox. And so when it was uh, in season, it didn't cause the massive outbreaks that it might have otherwise, compromising the Revolutionary Army's ability to be in the field. Now, as before, the big name for germ theory and microscopy is Louis Pasteur. And we visited him already, but let's elaborate on Louis Pasteur's accomplishments. So not only was he a massive proponent of germ theory, and not only did he disprove how spontaneous generation didn't work to create life, he showed that microbes were present in spoiled beer and wine. Microbes were responsible for making silkworms ill. And he saved the French beer, wine, and silk industries by doing those um, examinations and coming up with ways to treat the food through pasteurization or by isolating the infected worms away from healthy ones. Now, the other thing that he did was, um, it wouldn't be a direct outcome of Jenner's work, but he took the idea of a weakened version of a disease and inoculating someone with it and applied it to rabies. Now, rabies is an invariably fatal disease. I believe there is one instance documented where a person spontaneously recovered from rabies in all of human history. It's incredibly just vicious, nasty disease. And um, what happened was Louis Pasteur was trying to come up with a way to weaken the rabies virus, although it wasn't known to be a virus, but weaken that pathogen so that people could mount a response to it without it actually being able to attack them. So he'd done a couple trials, but one day a, uh, a young boy was brought to him who had been attacked by a rabid dog. He'd actually been defending other children from this rabid dog and had been bitten, been bitten very badly. And so he was going to die. So Pasteur began the process of injecting him with a weakened strain of rabies, knowing that there was really nothing to lose. This kid was going to die if he did nothing. And so it actually worked. And this is the first time an invariably fatal disease was not only just stopped, but reversed. It actually took that disease and made it ineffective. So Pasteur deserves all the credit that he's been given. He was a great showman. He did some things that weren't so awesome, but he was absolutely fearless in his laboratory work. And I think uh, if we add things up here, rabies vaccine, saving the wine and beer industries in France and making sure silk undergarments remain a possibility. He may just be the greatest person ever. So let's give it up for Louis Pasteur. Now, when it comes to history, no one is 100% perfect, but I think we can agree that uh, on balance, Louis Pasteur seems to be holding up pretty well. All right, so we've been stuck with pretty lousy pharmacology this whole time. We've been stuck with this conglomeration of accumulated contradictory information about simples and compounds. And a very famous quote from the 1860s, uh, got him to Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., really kind of sums this up. And if you haven't heard it before, it's a fairly famous quote. It's, I firmly believe that if the whole Materia Medica as now used could be sunk to the bottom of the sea, it would be better for mankind and all the worse for the fishes. And he really wasn't wrong. Because basically, at this time, we had things like foxglove, we had opium, we had uh, morphine, we had alcohol, but we had a lot of things that were just pure poison. We had treatments that were ineffective or actually harmful. One very common treatment for a variety of illnesses, especially syphilis, was to dose people with mercury and their teeth would fall out, they'd get ill, but since they had syphilis, it wasn't felt to be, oh, well, they're just getting worse, but it's presumed that the mercury was helping, even though it was absolutely positively not helping. So there was just a terrible record of pharmacologic efficacy and no real push to investigate to make it better. But thankfully, in the 18 and 1900s, that started to change. So Friedrich Wohler, 
was able to show that you could actually synthesize organic substances from inorganic compounds. At the time, it was thought by people called vitalists that living material was inherently different from unliving material. And this really kind of laid the ground for the idea that chemistry applies equally to living and non-living systems. It's all molecules and compounds, whether it's unliving material organisms or not. Claude Bernard showed that you could actually use a poison arrow to actually affect the muscular system. So curare would actually cause paralysis of the muscles. And in the early, uh, kind of the, going into the late 1800s, really, is when we start to have pharmacology really come into its own as a field. So Oswald Schmiedeberg basically created modern pharmacology by isolating muscarine and showing that it affected the heart the same way that the vagus nerve did. And essentially, if you remember that muscarine would affect muscarinic receptors, and those are the receptors found in the parasympathetics going to the heart, you would understand that he was basically hacking that system from two different ways. Stimulating the vagus nerve would affect that response, but doing the chemical reaction caused by stimulation of the vagus nerve would do the same thing. And a student of his, an American named uh, John Jacob Abel, uh, basically founded the American Society for Pharmacologic Experimental Therapeutics. It's still in existence. It's still around. And he did a lot of amazing things when he was a professor at Johns Hopkins. He extracted epinephrine from the adrenal glands and showed that it had the same effect as stimulants would uh, in other systems. Histamine and crystalline insulin were also isolated by him, showing that you could isolate living compounds and they would have therapeutic effects for people. There we go. Now another, we'll call it a medicine for the moment, that was very popular at the time was cocaine. And no one really knew what cocaine did apart from being a stimulant. But as plants were investigated, cocaine became very much in vogue because it was definitely known to have different effects. Now, one effect that it had that was indisputably important was it's an excellent um, anesthetic for mucous membranes. And a Carl Kohler was an optometrist who found that you could actually use it to numb someone's eye and do eye surgeries. Now, that's impressive. What I find more impressive is that people were doing eye surgeries before topical anesthetics existed. Now, you might be able to have someone hold down your arm or your leg during an amputation, but how on earth do you hold an eye still when you're trying to cut into it and the person is feeling all the pain from it? So the fact that optom optom uh, optometrists were able to do surgeries of any kind blows my mind. But Carl Kohler found that cocaine, you know, put into liquid drop form, would numb the eye and allow people to actually have those procedures done. And people were just amazed at this immediately. He was put on to this by a Viennese neurologist who had looked for every possible theoretical or clinical way to use cocaine, but somehow managed to miss that it had uh, this great potential as a topical and as an injected anesthetic. But, and it he made him very depressed for a while, but he later rebounded. You know him as the father of psychoanalysis. That would be Sigmund Freud. But he was actually very bitter that uh, Carl Kohler scooped him on this uh, discovery and actually referred to him as uh, Coca-Cola for the rest of his life, since Coca-Cola had cocaine in it at the time. So it was a nice little jab at Kohler, who really didn't seem to mind that much. Now, moving into the 1900s, our first antibiotic comes along, and it was really a fortuitous observation by Alexander Fleming, who noted that he had a plate growing staphylococcus on it, but it had gotten in contaminated by penicillin, by a mold, penicillin's rubens, and that it actually caused the bacteria around it to die. Now, initially, he didn't think anything could come of it because he didn't think whatever that substance was could survive in the human body. And he actually stopped studying it for a while, but he changed his mind, came back to it, and started to isolate the penicillin that was being produced by that mold. Now, it was very difficult initially to isolate. It took a great deal of effort to get even a little bit. But a study was done on uh, infants who were born with uh, gynecocal infections of the eye, which would make them go blind. And four of the five infants who were treated were actually cured. So it was known that this was a fairly important innovation, but it wasn't very useful. Uh, just before World War II, however, there was a nightclub fire in Boston, 
And the people who had been burned in this fire were treated with, uh, very, at the time, very expensive stockpile of penicillin just to see if it would actually work to keep them alive and prevent the post-burn infections they were almost certain to get. And when it worked, the U.S. government was very intrigued because this is right after World War II started. So the U.S. government wanted this antibiotic around. And thanks to um, a woman named Margaret Hutchinson Rousseau, who graduated from MIT as an engineer, uh, we had 2.3 million doses ready for D-Day. So the Allies actually had a pharmacologic advantage over the Axis. And if that weren't good enough, our buddy here, Margaret Hutchinson Rousseau, also figured out how to make synthetic rubber. And the Allies were able to actually have rubber for tires and things like that. And I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the fact that we finally have a woman on the screen. We're three lectures in, and we finally have a woman on the screen for contributing. Now, we have the entire last lecture devoted to missed opportunities and how women and other minority groups have been excluded from medical and scientific practice and the damage that has been done. But let's give it up for Margaret Hutchinson Rousseau, keeping us safe on D-Day and making sure that synthetic rubber was available to keep us all happy and healthy and take World War II to the European theater. All right, so we're looking at roughly 12 to 15 percent of the soldiers who were treated for their wounds and amputations in the European theater at the time saved due to that innervation. All right, so moving forward, we've got the idea that you can fight disease through inoculation and pharmacologic treatment. Now, the idea that viruses were different from bacteria had come along, and it was known that viruses didn't respond to antibiotics. So we had another set of viral diseases that needed another route for treatment. So polio is yet another one of these diseases that has been ever present in human history. There's evidence here on the left in uh, Egypt of somebody with a relatively wasted leg that's flexed up so that we can see that it's probably poliomyelitis causing that. And here is what polio looks like in someone who's had suffering through it. We actually had a, a donor in the anatomy lab a couple of years ago who had post polio syndrome and uh, the muscles of her lower leg had no skeletal muscle tissue in them hardly at all. It was mostly replaced by adipose tissue. So it was a very nasty disease. And in 1952, uh, Jonas Salk was able to come up with a way to grow these um, viruses and then come up with a way to create um, the, the vaccination for them by weakening it with formalin, inactivating the virus, but leaving its surface available for our, our body to recognize and mount an immune response to. And that has basically gotten polio away from us. We've seen multiple invariably deadly or or very dis, um, disabling diseases like smallpox, polio, rabies, conquered as we've moved into the modern era. Now this one I don't really have a connection to other pre-existing uh, developments, but I love it too much to leave it out. CPR is also very recent. It was in 1956 that a researcher in Austria, uh, well actually pardon me, he was from Austria, but he was working in Baltimore, a guy named Peter Safar, figured out that you can actually do chest compressions and keep people alive through mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing and chest compressions. Now, he did this in a way that I would love to see how he could phrase this in our contemporary era with a human gift registry or a uh, institutional review board agreeing to allow him to do this. But he basically paralyzed 31 people's diaphragms with curare and then gave them mouth-to-mouth -mouth and did... Uh, chest compressions to keep them alive while their diaphragm was um, paralyzed. Now, thankfully for him and the rest of us, it worked. Because prior to CPR, the only way to treat someone whose heart had gone into arrest was through direct cardiac massage. And there's a great description of this by a guy named, um, oh gosh, I don't want to hold us back by trying to remember his name, but it was an author who was a surgeon and medical historian who described when he was a third year med student, basically in your guy's shoes, he was on hospital duty. He was the only doctor on the floor when a patient went into cardiac arrest and he had to do the normal standard treatment at the time, direct cardiac massage. What that means is he got out a huge blade, cut this guy's sternum open, opened it like a book and then compressed his heart with his hands to keep the blood flowing. So that is what had to be done prior to CPR coming along. Now, 
Uh, Peter Safar, if that wasn't good enough, also then came up with ways to help people learn CPR by developing Rescue Annie with a Norwegian toy company. And uh, later, when he was living in America, his 12-year-old daughter sadly died from an acute asthma attack, and he felt that if she'd been able to get to a hospital sooner, she would have survived. So he basically created the first EMS service. This was actually in Pittsburgh. And that obviously has spread and become much more well-known. So he was one of these interesting people who had multiple different impacts in medical history just by being a very persistent and insightful person. Now, also following World War II, we had another physician. This guy was in uh, Scotland named Ian Donald. And he had what I can only imagine to be a connection that none of us would really come up with. He thought somehow, you know, we've been using sonar to detect Nazi submarines. I think we should point it at people. And we did. And he came up with sonar. And basically, this technology, which he was able to kind of work through, redubbed as into ultrasound, was first used uh, clinically with a woman who was thought to have incurable cancer of the ovaries and was going to just kind of be put into that idea of hospice at the time and left to die. But the ultrasound showed him that she, in fact, had an ovarian cyst, which, A, could be removed, but would have killed her had it burst. So he was able to actually treat someone based on the findings from this ultrasound. And in 1959, he used it to image the head of a fetus in the uterus. And as many of us know, this is now not just a rite of passage, but in a very important screening tool during any kind of prenatal developmental kind of process. Now, moving back to pharmacology, we've looked at how pharmacologic uh, interventions have been made from natural sources. But in 1960, another Scot named James Black decided to do something a little more innovative. He reasoned that if you have stress reactions because of epinephrine binding to beta receptors, that if you could create a molecule that was similar to epinephrine but didn't actually elicit the response, you could actually block it. So he did drug design. Instead of discovering a drug, he designed propranolol, which was the first beta blocker, essentially blocking the action of epinephrine and not allowing the heart to be as revved up as it would be. So looking at the structure of epinephrine versus propranolol, it had a similar binding, but not at all the same effect on the receptor. So he was intensely private, and I love that uh, the quote was that he was, quote, horrified to learn that he'd won the Nobel Prize for this discovery in 1988. All right, that takes us to the end of our talk today, and I can't believe I actually made it to just about perfectly on time. So our next talk will be in 10 days, 30th of November, and we have the history of surgery on the Monday and Friday of that week. And if you haven't, uh, if you have friends who haven't been part of this so far, you might want to encourage them to pay attention to this one. It's a lot of fun. And for those of you who've enjoyed the talks up till now, oh, wait till we get to the next two. They are phenomenally amazing and horrifying in equal measure. <laughs>